Welcome. This is the January 11th Beehive production user call. We have Andrew, Samvel, Antrenig, Jan, myself, Michael, and we've gone through a few topics on our kind of informal time. Uh, Samvel had some questions about the untrusted hex zero builds, but it sounds like Antrenig has worked on those in the past. I didn't get super far with using that under Compat Linux and Deb Bootstrap, a little off topic. Uh, Jan Antrenig and I discussed Super V briefly. We have we know what we need to do. We just need to do it. And thank you, Jan, for describing how Run It and S6 behave slightly differently. And Antrenig has had a few months of experience with a very large deployment on a university system where Linux couldn't keep up. So the answer was to virtualize Linux under a single very large Beehive instance. And- Assumingly the largest until today. Until today, do tell. Okay, let us know about that, Andre Nick. Okay, so, uh, oh, thank you for writing the notes. Otherwise I'd had to go in and look every time. Okay, so we have a system, super micro, uh, AMD 7702, it's 64 core. We have two of those CPUs, each of them being 64 uh, cores and uh, two threads on each. So overall, the system has 265 V cores. Uh, so that's our overall count or, or no, or whatever the term is these days. Yeah. Um, however, we have a VM in there that runs using a Beehive. Sometimes it runs using VMB Hive, sometimes it runs using Super V, depending on where I am in my uh, development cycle. Uh, and the VM itself has 240 vCPUs and 1.5 terabytes of RAM. So from the two terabytes of RAM, we've allocated 1.5 to the VM itself. Uh, so overall design issues that we've had is that if, if you want to have more than 64, four cores, so you know that's single core, single socket. Uh, no, the, sorry, all of the cores on a single socket, then you have to uh, define how your topology looks like inside the VM as well for some reason. Uh, inside so in the case, VM, I, tell us more about that. I so may have missed in, that originally. Yeah, or rather for the VM. So oh, for, for the VM, okay, do, cool. Yep. For the VM. So for, for Beehive, we pass dash C, 240 and then comma socket two cores 60 threads two right so uh, that's that's the overall design in there uh so inside of linux it looks like two sockets uh with uh, 60 cores uh, with smt uh thank you Jan, for the terminology and we pass 1.5 uh, ter uh, terabytes of, 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 of wired memory. I have to very be, be very specific. Okay, so limitation number one, if uh, it's not wired memory, you can go as much as you want. I've even had 1.7 unwired worked, but for wired memory, it goes only up to uh, 1.5, gigabytes. That's the exact number that, that I got working. Uh, a gigabyte on top of that and it doesn't work. Um, and the reason why we needed wired memory is because we use um, a PCI pass-through with, with SRIOV. Uh, in SRIOV, we have an IX uh, interf an IXL interface, that's an Intel system, uh, X710. Uh, X710, it's a, it's a 10 gigabit system. We create two SR, two, two visual functions from of it, uh, IAVF0, IAVF1. One of those gets passed to the VM using a, a, a pass through. So uh, with wired, we can't go more than one, five, three, six gigabytes, and we need wired if you want to do uh, if you want to do a PCI pass through. This is you know the overall uh, context of of where I'm at. So bug number one, and this might not be Beehive itself, but it might be the Beehive grub loader that might be one issue or it could be the Beehive itself that's loading Linux. Uh, one out of 10 times, or maybe sometimes even one out of five times, depending depending on, I, I don't have a, an exact statistics on this. The memory will get wired and then Beehive will get stuck in demo. So it's waiting for disk. What is it exactly waiting for? I have no idea. I point all the, uh, I look into all the uh, file descriptors using Protostat 
uh, and it, it lists all the files that it should have access to. You know, the disk, the tap interface, the dev PCI, the dev VMM, the uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it looks all fine as far as I can tell. So I am not sure what the issue is, but one out of 10, uh, it it will it will move the process from the grub loader into the, uh, the, the beehive process itself. And then it will just get stuck. Um, only on boot? Uh, You're only using on grub beehive on a new deployment? Yes. Is there Are a you reason you're me... not using UEFI boot worms? I just forgot to use that, and I'm now I am not sure if I can convert an existing Linux deployment to a new UEFI. I mean, I know how to how to convert, but you know, so that's the yeah. Should I move to UEFI? Do you yes. think this would solve the issue? Grab Beehive is uh... very old. No, and it's not. Very, just very old. It's unmaintained. It depends on ancient GCC versions, uh, and nobody wants to keep the external bootloaders. It was a hack. It was a shortcut. It wasn't anything which we should keep on using. Okay, so UEFI all the way down. Okay, so in that case. I'll try moving to UEFI and do some brute force test, you know, boot it multiple times and see if it will again. But what uh, yeah. happens here now is that when you start the grub process and then you end the grub process and Beehive takes over the already initialized virtual machine. So you basically you have to do certain steps twice because you're really exiting the Grab process and then running the Beehive process. Do you think that I can convert an Ubuntu Linux that's installed in non UEFI mode into a UEFI mode? Because I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, of course you can. The question is easy. where you find the documentation on how to do it. A grub can be used with UEFI. Uh, the question is just how you oh. have to do it. Uh, the okay. nice thing is okay. because you're in a virtual system. There's nothing stopping you from adding a little helper device to hold the boot code. So even if your disks are full and you don't can't mm -hmm. change the partition table, you can ju exactly. just add a tiny little one gigabyte uh, that I/O device. Yes, yes. To as, hold as the a, UEFI a... boot code and UEFI yes. partition and so on. That is absolutely correct. And let me just check in here with LSBLK. No, I do not have an VFAT for partition. So it looks like I will need to use a separate device for that. And I oh, know you I have can to change the partition. What are you using That's... as backing storage for your disks? I am using a, a raw the... file. A raw file. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this initial so you could with... just. Um... Mm -hmm. Right. How large are your boot devices? Are you more? Are they above two terabytes? Sorry, my what? My boot your device. Your guest boot device. How large is the virtual mm. device? My guest is two hundred gigs. You should be able to put the uh, just grow the disk, uh, put the boot partition into the at the end, and because the end. okay. It, uh, it shouldn't be a problem uh, with modern systems to have uh, stuff before that. Okay, that okay. So unless just, maybe uh... if your disk is over two terabytes, that could trigger some. Basically, crossing this boundary could cause some broken firmware to explode in your face. Uh, yes. But yeah, that's, not two hundred gigabytes. Point. There's no boundary where you haven't already crossed. Yeah. Yeah, you've pushed point, plenty yeah. of limits. <laughs> no, no, that, as yes. in, there, as far as I know, there, yeah. there's no special boundary which causes new bugs to appear between 200 and 2000. Right. 20, uh, 2048. None of those powers of two. So, so, the, so, the, any, so, uh, the, so the raw file I expanded using truncate, let's say a gig, and then I... Yeah, just I, make I, sure I, you uh, <laughs> don't truncate it to one gig. <laughs> of course, of course. I don't convert it to one gig, of course, yes. And yeah, then yeah, I... Yeah. Uh, 
and then I, I convert the one gig to a VFAT partition or FAT32 or whatever the name is these days, and then I put the UEFI bootloader. I'm certain there's like some there. uh, distro specific documentation on how to convert mm -hmm. an existing installation. Yes. Yes. Okay. That that would be much better because I, I I absolutely hate Grub Beehive. Uh, sorry, Grub. Uh, yeah, Grub Beehive. Hard, yeah. Grub. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's a, a nasty hack. Yes, it is. Okay. And and sometimes using the, during kernel updates, things might go south. You know. So that. That's oh yes. Issue. Yeah. Or, Which we've had before. Yeah, and then you have to change the external device mapping for Grub in the. Yes. And yes. the so external Grub configuration. And by the way, Grub Beehive is in no shape or form a secure uh, um, hypervisor. It's a process okay. running as root, which reads untrusted file systems with hacked together, yes. stripped down file system drivers. Of uh, so yeah, it's... Uh, I should, I, should try, uh, I should try. I should try writing an exploit with that. Like, let's say there is a a, a cloud provider out there which is using Grub Beehive. Can you put code in your system that during the reboot it will execute on the host? Um, I don't know what do we have in there, but give it a try. That would be a very nice exploit to have there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also Depends on your point to... of view, but yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it also, it's yeah, a very you know, realistic that, attack. It, it is a very realistic attack if someone's using uh, Beehive as a hypervisor out there. And also, uh, this is also a very good value on supporting GL Beehive, you know? Of course. Yeah. Okay. I so was th that surprised was... that uh, I don't, don't remember who, but someone is working on improving Beehive load to use directory file descriptors and maybe even Capsicum on the way. So someone is cleaning up this mess instead of yeah. ripping it out. Yeah. But I can see some value in Beehive load because it is an easy way to exercise certain things uh, in the kernel. Yes. And uh, Michael, to answer your question, am I experiencing PR270966? No, I am not. I, I, I haven't had any issues with P PCI pass-through with my AMD CPU my motherboard, whichever Supermicro gave to us, and my neck. So I'm, I'm all good there. No problems on that. I'm having problems with the NIC itself, however, regardless of PCI. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Yes. And for that, I think I have the error message, which I sent to you over to Skype. Let me... Oh, right. Go message. ahead and drop that yes. here. That is because... IXL, the number, says... Uh, I uh, one second. I'm on a Mac. I can copy from an, a text from an image. One sec. That's the I think one of the benefits of having a Mac is doing that. Okay. I just hope that it recognizes uh, mono. What do you call that? Mono. Mono space. Mono spaces correctly. I Excel. Okay. Process admin queue correct. Uh huh. Unable to. You didn't copy the rest of the line, Mac. Stupid Mac. Unable to allocate memory. Or so memory. I've dropped in at least your little one from Thank elsewhere. You. And I also um, sent the. I sent also the uh, in, inside the thank chat. Thank you. So, Perfect. Um, I tried Googling for this. Yeah. The only result that it brings is the source code that prints this error message. It's a good in, start. In FreeBSD dev. So it's a good start. <laughs> um, uh, I started reading yeah. the I started reading the source code for the IXL driver. Yeah. Um, I thought it would be very big as a, like a driver code, but it's not as big as I've, I've seen <laughs> other drive like Mellanox drivers or whatever are like much much bigger. So um, I'm going over it. Uh, it's it's clearly a issue with a memory buffer. I'm just not sure when or where is that allocated. Is it configurable or not, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm in the middle of that. We're we're seeing this issue on both of the interfaces. FYI. Ah, okay. Uh, so you can see also in the message it says IXL one as well. Oh, as yeah, IXL there it is. Yep. It could be because they are connected on the same bus. I'm not sure. Like you know, it's it's a single. PCI card with two NICs on it, not not two separate PCI cards with the next. But again, I have no knowledge in that area, and um, it only happens when there is massive I/O operations happening over the network. Sorry, network operations happening over the network. So we use NFS, <clears throat> and uh, 
And, you know, this is for scientists. So the amount of data you can imagine is, is like each project can go for terabytes and terabytes. Each file could be hundreds of gigabytes. So um, that's the issue with that we were having. Um, so sometimes ZFS would, 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 you know, not keep up or, you know, or rather our SAS disk would not keep up. So today I just added a, um, uh, as 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 uh, as as uh, as log yeah, device. A, lo a log a log yeah, separate log yep. um that yes. said is this is this simply a warning or it's impacting performance when this happens everything stops everything, everything stops. stops got it thank you like you can't even do enter in the console to get the login shell okay uh jan didn't uh, this come up a few weeks ago about the new months weeks or months about yeah i guess the holidays uh the newer card is a lot more software dependent as i recall and then we we had exactly so, this come up yes and no uh the yes newer no. cards like the x710 which isn't new anymore to be honest um is a lot more software defined so a lot more functionality is implemented in the firmware running on the card instead of a dedicated hardwired silicon, which means that, yes, it's more flexible. It can offload more things. It also means it is uh, in total more complex and can have new bugs and had a bunch of bugs at release time. And so, um, yeah, that's just what it is. And some things were, especially things which used to be just write to this register and it happens. And now it is send a message to the firmware and wait for the firmware to finally look at your message. So some things were slower and so on. But in general, the card should work these days. And that's just the design choice. So the other thing is that, yeah, this means that you have an admin queue for administrative commands on the card and it looks like that queue it's either full or uh, it tries to grow it and can't allocate memory. I don't know. Grab for the string in the driver source code. If you can't find it, grab for substrings and find where, where it is. Maybe so there's a CTL to make the logging output from the driver more verbose. Be careful with this. So you can easily swamp your system with a loaded NIC driver throwing megabytes per second of log messages at the system. And uh, Antrinik, you said you couldn't get uh, to the console. Whose console would that be? Uh, the, the host, host, the guest? Okay. The host. And how the host. did you try to get to the console via SSH over the same NIC? IPMI as well as physical console. Okay. The, if you can't use IPMI or physical console, something... Uh, Definitely really messed up. Yeah. yeah. Properly messed up. So it's not just that your SSH connection is also affected by this. No, no. Well, like I, you cannot even SSH. Like you, you don't get you, you you immediately get a reset. That's also interesting because yes. if the system was un completely unresponsive, you wouldn't even get a reset. Get a reset, but I'm getting a reset. Hang. So something is happening wrong on the NIC level. And uh, no, wait a if second. If you're getting you, a reset, you get a reset something along the, the kernel the, is responding. Something along the way sends a reset. So you, you're getting a TCP reset or an ICMP host unreachable or something. Something which is interpreted as immediately abandon this connection attempt. Yeah, so, I can I can ping. I just remembered this, that, but this happened months ago, so you know I'm I'm not hundred percent sure. But I remember yeah. I could ping, uh, so ICMP is moving. But as soon as I could, I would try to SSH. I was getting a reset, which got me worried. Like, did I mess something up? And then I looked up into into the IPMI, and I see this. And this happened again today, when we and I, this is very easy to replicate. Like, I just you know transfer multiple large files, and da -da -dun, there you go, it stopped. So, uh, and I'm, I know our network is not a bottleneck because I'm looking inside the network traffic in the this switch. This is no nothing which uh, would be caused by having an yeah. overloaded network connection. Exactly, yeah. This is, oh. 
Also, so, what does it mean unable to allocate memory for the admin queue event? Because um, uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, so it could be that the admin queue is a ring buffer or, uh, of pointers to messages and it failed or something like that. So you have to look here. In... I do have also the location in the source code where it does that. And I'll send the uh, source code in a second. Yeah, it's a def ixl if underscore ixl dot c. Excel dot c, yeah, it's line 13 to 78. But yeah, I'll send the link regardless in case anyone wants to check later. Um, is C git up? Because C git was down for a couple of hours, a couple of days actually. Yeah, it's back. Okay. Anjanig, what's your MTU? I found the discussion from last October on the jail. My call. MTU. That's a very good question. So my the, MTU is actually uh, November twenty something call. We discussed it. Uh, um, I found it. No, no, wait a second. Okay, so it's 9,000. Wait a second. Am I doing this right? With this with this, this allocation has failed. Uh, so I you mean, had a Colonel Malloc call uh, with the no wait issue. flag, uh, and that allocation failed. So what happened is that your system is under enough memory pressure that it, the kernel memory allocator can't find memory to uh, allocate a new event to go into the admin queue without blocking. Yep. Uh, so yeah, you're. it's a symptom of heavy memory pressure. Um, I don't know what's the size here. So what you could do is you could change the device printf call here to uh, print this variable to find out how large the allocation is. Uh, it's asking for. Let me check if the module is dynamic or static. Um, that shouldn't matter at that point. I just don't want to compile the kernel from scratch, you know. Um, the IXL yeah. is part of yeah. IXL is part of the kernel. KLD stat yeah. dash v, I guess. IXL, not ILX. IXL. IXL is part of the kernel yes yeah so it's part of generic I, I, yeah i would need to recompile the kernel it's okay oh, i can do that, there is I, aren't there ports for newer versions yes but um, those uh oh, the trick to the, the thing is if you're testing a different version compiled with different options from ports you're not actually reproducing the error you're looking if it goes away Another thing, Michael. And that, the other uh, thing is that it only works by rebooting or by detaching and then manually attaching the other driver. I also have checked. I also have checked. Um, uh, I also have checked the ports uh, driver as well as the internal driver, and the internal driver is more up to date than the ports driver. I don't know how that happened. Oh, interesting. There you go. I, I I don't know how that happened, but it is more up to... Like, um, like at some point, the... probably the entry driver was up to date, and then there was yeah. no reason to update the other one. Yeah, yeah. Unless, of course, you know, uh, Intel pushed another one. So, I don't know. I do have to check. I do have okay. To check. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you don't have to get do that because in the line above, you see that the length I wanted to know is just the define and the define is uh, 4K. So, what 4K. happens is uh, in this uh, allocator zone uh, for the driver, it fails to allocate without blocking. Uh, yeah, that's just what happens. So your system is under very high memory pressure, which it is. isn't there. There, which is not um, surprising if you throw uh, that much uh, memory to a single guest and wire it down. You effectively removed three uh, fourths of your physical memory. So maybe you should look into downsize, uh, putting a manual cap on the ZFS arc size. It is, it is, it is, it's set to 64 and it never okay. reaches 64. Hmm. So I don't know who is using the memory. Oh, that's a good question. Like top. Who, 
Um, yeah, I, I can look into resident it. memory size. Exactly, exactly. So th that's also a very good question. Make sure um, to also uh, bring in system processes and so on. Exactly. Yeah, I've never looked into that to see who's using from the system processes. Yeah, capital P, capital S can be your friend. Yes. Well, capital P destroys my screen. Oh, well, yeah, get I a bigger so terminal, buddy. <laughs> I know, yeah, you, you're in a special <laughs> case there. <laughs> yeah, this is true. I know, right? <sighs> okay, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm I'm in a I'm I'm in a non googleable like uncharted territory at this point, you know, where like how many I I, I if there's anyone who knows any other company who de who deploys on these kind of hardware and on these kind of big VMs, I I would be happy to know. So well, uh, maybe Santiago, but he's having major issues with the AMD SRIOV issue uh, and IOM and Mu, but you are not having those issues, so that's quite fascinating. No. What's his nick? Uh, that should be in the review I pasted there. Okay. I'll and have a look. when I said question, are you having this? It's like, what the heck? Uh, you should no, be dead in the water, but you're not. That's great. That's that's good yeah. evidence to work off of. And yeah. previously on the calls, you brought up exactly this, and it was all related to uh, jumbo frames, and you backed off on that, and it was resolved according to the notes. So that's a there you have good it. Question: My jumbo frames issue. Uh, I went from nine thousand to four thousand ninety six or ninety four. I don't know which one me and Jan discussed and and, and went to. So uh, the but problem after, start, uh -huh. The problems happen when you have uh, M buffs larger than a four K page. Okay. Because then you try to allocate 9K or something, or even 16K MBUFs, and the, those have to be physically continuous. So here the problem is outer versus inner fragmentation. So as the, that you can't find memory pages which are next to each other in physical memory in free for use. And you have to allocate those early before your uh, physical memory is fragmented. Yeah. Okay. So, so th this is a very interesting one. Uh, this as is a very long as you one. have TSO and LRO on and are mostly using TCP, you don't really need the big MTU because TSO and LRO. Uh, so. Yeah transmit uh, size offloading and uh, receive uh, size offloading or whatever the exact name is. Um, so the uh, reduce the CPU function. overhead because the yeah. kernel network stack gets the packets we uh, we um, segmented as fake packets of 32k or so. So the uh, the, the the virtual function had an MTU of 9000 fyi just right now you know mm -hmm. when this error occurred i'm i'm wondering if that had an effect um i was supposed nope. to change the mtu of the uh, visual function of that nick as well look uh, at the line the malloc invocation you're effectively asking the kernel memory allocator for 4 kilobytes of memory without allowing it to block Hmm. which can be required because there are lots of situations in drivers where you're not allowed to sleep, so block on memory allocations. And because you're holding locks which are not sleepable. Like you're holding, extreme example, you're holding a spin lock. You must not sleep in the kernel while holding a spin lock. Um, so, and yeah, that's the situation. So it's just a warning that a memory allocation failed and something couldn't be done because of that. The, the real fix is to uh, alleviate the memory pressure. <laughs> and he's gone. Yeah, he probably lost his uh, 
mobile internet connection. Yeah, I ran out of data memory for, fresh. for the month. Uh, yeah, talk to you in a month. In. <laughs> exactly. exactly. The next month, exactly. I don't uh, know. Oh, you're so sardonic. Yeah, that does um, suck. What did I want to ask? Oh, uh, Jan, as you disappeared to CCC, we did, you, you and Anshanik discussed perhaps desired ACPI values that Beehive might want to support. Is that well, anything tangible? I don't remember tangible? that discussion. Uh, maybe it was just him and I, but it's like we have the reset and power off, but I think there were some missing ones. So let's see if he can jump on his girl, uh, his fiance's uh, there is, phone. Um, yeah, I don't even know if, I think I remember your discussion, but I wasn't really involved in it. Hmm. The thing is, uh, you were talking about that, um, how to handle rebooting a system with All Super right. V. Well, there's that, and, but it led to this discussion. Yeah, and the problem is that Beehive doesn't really have a way to request the guest to tell it to please reboot. Hmm. So what you have to do is, um, so there, and on a physical system, you don't really have a reboot button. You have a reset button and a shutdown button. Right. And I said, I don't even know if such an ACPI uh, feature exists. And it's not something FreeBSD could add. It's something which has to be present in the ACPI specification. If this okay. feature isn't there, you can't fix the design. You have to work with what you got. Of course. So let's see if he can rejoin. If not, such is life. And we can push the rest of these topics to the future. I was hoping Santiago could compare notes on the those nicks, but no worries. Oh, didn't he Archie have Nick, where um, are you? Melanox, uh, maybe send him a signal message to his phone. This is true. Let me jump on here. Uh, here's the review. Yeah, that's with Santiago, right? Yep. That's him. Yes, he was in Coimbra with all, all of us. But that would be interesting if it's limited to that, Nick. It oh, could yeah. also be that that but the Nick uh, Santiago uses requires more uh, features of the IOMMU to be virtualized. It could just be that the Intel one is yeah. a bit less featureful. Which driver did he have? Uh, uh, I'll start at it. No, that's earlier. That's I'm... there. Oh, he there is. he is. There he is. Uh... Ah, Melanox. It looks like if I'm seeing that. That's your time. So, Anshnig, we were speculating that you're you just ate up your monthly data plan, and we'll talk to you in twenty days. This microphone isn't uh -huh. muted. La 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 la. Are you back? Yeah. He's still muted. Maybe he spilled some coffee on his. I, uh... I, ah, you're back. There he is. Well, no, I, I got a phone call. So uh, you know, when you get a phone call, your just connection loop him drops in. down to. We'll help him out. Your connection drops down to 4G. Sorry, 3G instead of yeah. 4G. So then Zoom drops out and uh, I start shouting at everyone. Anyways, uh, where were we? A uh, quick question. We I think we've covered yes. that and I will compare to what Nick uh santiago was using and then you and i spoke directly about possible missing acpi buttons on beehive is that oh it's not possible it is it is it is actually tell, tell us more please 
Um, so, so generally you would want to send a, um, what do you call that? A, uh, a signal. Next phone call. Next phone call. You know, <laughs> to wait or to okay. hit center. <laughs> Give me a sec. Yep. <laughs> Give me a sec. Give me a sec. Okay, let's do this. It should work. Bring back the audio and the video. Okay. Am I back? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Way better. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can send a signal to a beehive process for it to shut down. Uh, that signal would be, and I'm I'm not sure which signal that is actually, but uh, it is documented in the MAM page. You send an ACPI power off. Uh, there's also a way to use. I I think there's a way to use Beehive CTL to do that as well, but uh, I might be wrong. No, there's just force reset and uh, force power off in, you, in Beehive CTL. You pasted what was there and wasn't there. Maybe that was in a different chat. I now remember that. If if you have a list of those, that would be great. Okay, I'll here it is. Signal that. handling in the Beehive man page. Signal well, handling that, in yes. the Beehive man page. Yes. You send sig mm -hmm. term, and it will trigger ACPI power off for the VM. Yep. Okay, so the VM will get a power off uh, signal. I was wondering if we can all if we can also do like instead of power off, we can also send uh, a reboot where uh, in, in another signal where the beehive process would also restart itself. Is that, uh, Jan, while you were on a call, Jan pointed out that real hardware has a reset, but not a reboot. Are those one and the same? Are they different? Would we be entering non-standard territory, although it might be super useful? So but. the thing is, it's easy to add a new signal handler to beehive. The question is what, can the signal handler do? Um, here the problem is that, yep. Yeah. Is there a way to, via ACPI, request that the host kernel initiate a reboot? Is that even something ACPI can express? If it is, okay, it's probably fairly straightforward to add to Beehive. If it, this feature just doesn't exist, you would have to add it all the way through uh, ACPI to all the ACPI implementations out there in the operating system kernels, which is a giant uh, project. But if it's already there, just passing that, exposing this functionality, should it exist, uh, would, wouldn't be too hard. So is anyone familiar with what ACPI can do and can't do? Reportedly, Antrenig did quite a bit of that, did you not? Um, like ACPI work in the back in the day with Gentoo? I, I, I have done some ACPI work there, but uh, I mean, there there is... So so on hardware, what when you press on like the restart button, you know, it, it actually sends a power off and then the hardware knows that it has to restart. That That's one thing. Okay. And, the so... AC, yeah, and then the ACPI reset is when you press and hold the restart button, and it just, you know, completely shuts down the machine and starts it back so off again. So what which is we an could reset. do, mm -hmm. uh, which would be, f is to just have a new signal handler, which does what the normal one does, and then record the fact that this signal has been delivered in a flag and check that just before we exit to exit with a not yet allocated exit uh, code so that it would there would be a new exit code which then could be dispatched upon. So basically this machine really or to wait, we already have a reboot one, so we could just believe lie and say, Yeah, I know that the guest said it, it performed the shutdown, 
but deliver the exit code for reboot. Yeah, that makes sense because from the yeah, from the host yeah, perspective, all you care about work. is that it cares. Yeah, yeah, that that one absolutely makes sense. Yes, but 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 my so question we already also have that is... exit code and. So it would just yes. grab a signal number, which isn't problematic to squat for this functionality, or finally so Michael, get um, the IPC socket. <clears throat> so sick term is triggering for power off. Which signal yeah. should I go with for uh, a user reset two? or a restart? I was thinking of, of the same, like user one, user two would make more sense. User right? two probably because users sometimes send user one if they are familiar with Linux. Because sometimes on Linux user run is used like sick info on real Unix. Yes. Real Unix, that sounds funny. Sorry. Be nice. Because, Be nice. It's, because it's true. Yeah, but it's just uh, needling away needlessly. Is that simply lowercase all. user number one? Yes. I'm not finding a reference. Lowercase user number two, yes. Um, oh, oh, sorry, uppercase. No, I said lowercase. My apologies. Uppercase two? <laughs> Depends on your convention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everything depends on the convention. Okay. So is that something to explore? I honestly think so, because it, it could be very useful in a lot of scenarios as far as I can. Um, the thing is that I would still say, let's exit the beehive process in this case, and then let the supervisor clean up and start a new just like a re reboot initiated by typing sudo reboot or shutdown dash r or something because mm -hmm. you don't want to keep using the uh, dirty guest state hmm. so that the, the remaining on the, reboot the you MM get device. a fresh allocated virtual devices and stuff like that in the reset state just don't expose any partially initialized state to, to the new rebooted guest okay and Antrenig going full circle if you want to just describe how you could not do this on VMware financially or on perhaps EMU <laughs> for other reasons, that is a truly unburying of the lead. So uh, be before me, and yep. as you have guessed, this uh, server was configured by a Windows admin, like the hardware. That's why we also have a hardware the rate card on the board, which I've changed it to work in HBA mode, but it's not it's still, it's not a real HBA. So we're also changing the hardware rate card anyway. Uh, long story short, they uh, the scientists obviously said, well, we can't use Windows on this. And they were like, okay, what about, what about ESXi? Because apparently that's the only two hypervisors that people are aware of, you know? Uh, yeah. So um, they asked for a quota from uh, VMware and um, approximately uh, having a VM, like the one that I'm running there, which is, you know, a single very fat VM is uh, uh, almost with that pricing, you know, like something around 20K. Now don't don't quote me on this legally speaking, mm -hmm. but um, that's, the, that's the number that we got from uh, the reseller at least, you know, who's supposed to bring the license, blah, blah, blah. Well, so, um, um, or, 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 rather, or, rather, or rather between- It's 20K per 20. year now. Now this yeah, week, yeah, yes. yeah, it's worth <laughs> it, it's worth noting that that was what VMware told you. That's not what Broadcom told you, which may very well be worse. Who told me? Broadcom, the new owner of Broadcom VMware. Broadcom bought so. VMware. Oh, <laughs> that's a very they're oh in my the God, let's by the yeah. new acquisition phase. There's so yeah. prices are going up until they squeeze drive a new um, acquisition 
that's just what they do. Okay. Of course. Your first of spelling course. was fine with me. Uh, <laughs> I, what? Which part did I get wrong? I forgot. I. But yeah. Ah, cool. Okay. Uh, you are VM worn. Ha. <laughs> Yeah. So okay. no, obviously I was not happy with the numbers and when I told them open source. So these are scientists. Of course open source. What do you mean not open source? So they were very happy with that. Okay, then moving on to say uh, QEMU KVM. What limits did you hit? Uh oh oh god, I did have those documented somewhere. Uh so I've got some of the doc, I... hopefully I'm sharing. Uh, uh, I remember I've shared most of the things with you, but yeah, you couldn't get past sure. a terabyte of RAM, which is a surprise. Yes, yes, on Chemu, I was not able to achieve more than terabyte of RAM. Now I'm, I don't know if that's a Chemu issue or a KVM issue, I because I, it's very you know defragmented there, less or so. So uh, no, I could not get more than terabyte of RAM, but that that was the first part of the issue. Um, the second part is when I started allocating big number of CPUs, uh, basically more than 128. Uh, when I started allocating more than 128, the guest would start lagging. Uh, uh, and, and now I, I'm not very familiar with like how hypervisors work, work internally, but uh, that was the issue that I was having. Um, so yeah, there you go. How did you... Um... How did the lagging uh, materialize in your system? How did the lagging materialize? So, so what, um, what was it bad enough for Linux to say that some CPU has stopped making progress and trigger the deadman switch? Watchdog, yeah. So uh, sometimes it would it would it would throw a watchdog error in the console in in the in the in the kernel messages. Sometimes um, the I/O would just like go very 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 down. Uh, so sometimes the network would start lagging. Uh, so it, it was in in different ways of things. So if it was a if it was a game, you know, if it was a graphical game, I would I would say that the FPS was low. You know, like which which means a number of things. It could be from your GPU, could be from your CPU, could be from your setup or whatever. But you know, in in kind of that kind of an analogy. But you no, know, everything was terribly slow until it was almost unusable when i was starting to use all of the cores to run a benchmark test for the uh, you know the the scientific tool mm -hmm. i'm asking because it, you can have terrible latency spikes and still good average throughput so that have... in games that would late. be the average frame rate staying almost normal but the frame timings uh, are terrible. And so if you are looking not just at the average, but at the 1% percentile or the 0.01% percentile, you see vast spikes or... Yeah, oh, that, that, like that. That, I, that I couldn't go that deep, you know? Like from, yeah. from my perspective, it was like, I, I gave uh, the machine for a test to one of the scientists and he's like, this is slower than our, you know, machine that you were supposed to read. Yeah, me. so yeah. I, I'm not okay with this. So I said, mm -hmm. okay, sounds good to me. Like that, that's that, that's the only benchmark that I need to hear. You know, <laughs> what OS did computer. you run that on? What Linux so distribution? So the, the host op the host operating system was Gentoo. Okay. With the latest kernel, latest mainline kernel, latest uh, Chemu and everything. Thank you, Gentoo, for that. And uh, the uh, the guest operating system was uh, Ubuntu, the same. The guest was absolutely the same. Got it. Yeah. Did you wire down the guest memory? Uh, did I wire the guest memory? No. No, I did not. But, and you weren't you using SRIOV the, yet? Uh, VCPUs and unload. I was not using. Course? I was not. I was not using pass, pa, pa, PCI pass through yet. No. Sorry, Jan, you were asking. Did you uh, pin the VCPU uh, to a specific uh, host CPU calls? Yes. Yes, I did. That one I did try. Uh, I used the C groups, uh, whatever it was, to. To, to pin to, uh, well I, they actually do have CPU the same idea of CPU sets in, in Linux as well so I use that yes okay interesting so, so it was an almost 
or probably um, as fair as you could make a comparison. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I really wanted for that to work. You know, I, I tried as much as I can to make it work, but uh, no luck there. You know, rooting for the other team, I see. And you didn't have a chance to try Zen, right? Uh, no, sir, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a Zen guy. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm. Don't apologize for that. But I'm curious. Then, what other choices are available on the market? Like, what am I spacing here? I go. Of course, Illumos Beehive. But what's left? <laughs> uh, uh, Mac OS niche, hypervisor no, framework. <laughs> not really, uh, unless you want. No, forget it. You're I'm not joking. going to get drivers to run Mac OS on the physical system. Of you course. you can you can you can try Windows, but that's also going to be expensive. Like we haven't even got yeah 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 the uh, hyper, but like I, I didn't oh, even yeah, want Windows to get into the center. pricing of that. Uh, exactly. I've heard of some pretty serious limits on either you know vCPUs or something. I forget what they are, but do they you might hit same issues or worse. Um, let me do a quick search on that. Go ahead. You know, you then what else do you have? Uh, <laughs> The question is that do you really want to call ca uh count Zen anymore as a maintained supported hypervisor? Be nice. It's no, 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 it's someone's happy wasn't with it. meant to be a, a mean question, but really, is anyone still working on that as an open source project? Ah, uh, it's working or on FreeBSD, and I worked out an issue with Roger to get graphics working on an AMD host. So it's, because uh, uh, I'm afraid that basically everyone moved over to KVM QEMO. Of course. Then you have things like Firecracker, which are niche. Yep. Yeah. What, what's 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 even Firecracker? I have no idea. What it's it a like specialized hypervisor for short-lived guests. So for the la la yeah, Lambda so, function stuff. Like so where you basically, applications and such. Yeah, basically on demand launched as in, I have a request queued, now spin up the virtual machine, reuse it for a thousand requests, similar to what PHP FPM does or something. Like spin it up. That, that makes uh, no sense. Why not? Because like you would want a container for that, not a VM. Yes and no. If you have a uh, situation that can't be done by a normal container. Oh. Uh, the reason why you may want to have a VM for that is because you want the isolation boundary and don't trust the Linux containers. Uh, and you want a smaller interface than the system call ABI. As far as, I mean, Hyper-V being in this list goes... Unless you're planning on running Windows, I don't see Hyper-V making sense in general. If you're running Windows, it makes sense because you're already going to be buying the uh, the Windows Data Center license anyway. So It only makes sense on workstations where you have to have Windows on the host. Well, for, for any applications where, where you need Windows. Right. No, no reason there. Sometimes it's better to run Windows under QEMO, even if you care about performance. I'm just curious on the little cute matrix of different hypervisors. Where do we stand in the beginning of 2024? Then and the best one. <laughs> um, one of the bad that. things about Beehive oh. is that as the blessing of late birth, basically, it lacks a bunch of the legacy features which are now implemented in hardware. So we don't have to have all the crap to support 15 or more year old CPUs. Yep. Which means that sometimes Beehive has lower overhead for purely compute bound workloads. Because it's so, unrestricted guest mo mode or bust. And sometimes it means that you can't actually run all VMs there. Hmm? What? Sometimes it also means that you can't like run actual old VMs there. Because we've had a scenario where a customer... Oh, old VMs. To... Oh, you want like a BIOS booted VM and UEFI... Uh, In theory... Yeah, that's just an option we need, which is, uh, yeah, on... 
live support with BIOS mode uh, option ROM. But that's not really a hypervisor features that you can run a BIOS on top of Beehive. You just need one. It is remarkably hard to find stats on the latest Hyper-V. And I know they've, they're gradually removing it. Core went away. Yeah, they, they prefer you use their cloud platform. The removal of Core was very hard for some of our customers because it was kind of a perfect scenario where you want a disposable host, less or so, you know. Or say. a really cheap mm -hmm. Windows desktop that won't have graphics yeah, acceleration, yeah. but it's like, oh, this is usable. Hello. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Okay. Wait, are you yes. limited Daniel, to welcome. 128 Gosh. virtual sockets? That's not much of a limitation or virtual CPUs. No, no, that's the thing. I can find some information, but not much more. And it's because, I've been searching uh, the last few minutes and just not seeing it. So yeah, they will they VMware forces you to like most of them to you know map it out with uh, different uh, topologies, but no biggie. Anyway, Daniel, we've been just yakking away. Do you have any topics? And thank you again for Zelta. You're welcome. Um, let's I gave see, a quick no... overview of it earlier before we started recording. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> of course. Um, no, uh, I do have a question about the last conversation about about Zen's uh, popularity and usability. Isn't Zen used by some of the cloud providers as a as a uh, as a type provider, like well, I thought uh, it was even used Amazon, by AWS. Uh, virtual machines are based on Zen, but these are the really old platforms. Okay, so that's, and that's and I'm sure that they coded around. And the other question you know, is they, if they actually ever gave anything back. Right. Yeah. Okay. They basically forked makes... it, it would seem. Yeah, okay, that's the that's the way to think about that. Okay. So it's like Mac OS and FreeBSD. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Yeah. yeah. Uh Daniel, what amount of beehive are you using in 2024? Um all of it. Uh, Great, perfect. So good I, answer. Yeah. <laughs> So I've I've actually started using it a little bit more for FreeBSD as well, cool. um, just because you know I, I realize that you know I do have bare metal servers and I do want to do my FreeBSD testing for my FreeBSD hosts on on bare metal, but there are a lot of a lot of things with file systems and you know on boot and with fresh machines and things that I can you know, roll back and, and use. I've been using a little more of, uh, you know, of, of FreeBSD on Beehive, not just Windows and Linux. Um, so, yeah, did I did I mention in a previous call that the that the um, that the uh, the FreeBSD image, the official FreeBSD fourteen image, uh, dies after first boot if you use bi load yeah we did talk about that before oh right? interesting maybe not that should be on so my i remember Yan commenting on it so it uses it uses the i think the the host like boot lua files or boot something files so what happens is you boot if you do beehive load on the on the official freebsd 14 vm now if you use it uefi no problem but if you use Beehive load, it boots, it automatically upgrades its zpool. Oh, sorry, this is for the ZFS version of the official. Oh, good to know. VM. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Official version of the ZFS or FreeBSD 14 VM image, you boot it in Beehive load, and then on second boot, it dies because it, it upgrades its pool. And if you're running, um, unless you're running uh, a, a a future version. So if you're running 14 on the host, I think, I think it doesn't happen. I haven't, I haven't tested it yet. Um, oh, so if you boot it on 13, it might grab Lua boot blocks from 13 and kind of upgrade the pool and put you out of alignment. So I think it's just, 
Okay, so when you boot the 14 ZFS VM, it upgrades its ZFS pool. Mm -hmm. And and that happens, and, and it can boot on 13. So the first time you boot it, it'll work. And then if you boot it again, it'll use 13, the host, the host boot stuff in some way. I'm sorry, I don't know the That's okay. exact. It's probably a ZPool language. upgrade, which uh, breaks your guest in that right. case. So it comes because up with that the, will, yeah. uh, enable features to be automatically used and then the feature gets used and afterward the old boot blocks or in that case beehive load can no longer read the pool. Right. However, the workaround is yeah. just change the loader to UEFI and it's still it's still gonna work exactly the same. Right. There's gonna be no the nice no thing about FreeBSD is that for a long time the installer has supported installing it uh, as both BIOS and UEFI bootable. Uh, but which... it's still the case as far as I know. Yeah, but other operating systems only do one or the other, while FreeBSD makes it really easy to get both. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 it's I'm, so also annoying that uh, Linux with distributions refuse to uh, support both at the same time. Yes. Chip boot code for both modes. These days, it's less and less important, but for a few years, it was really annoying. Oh, no, I can't take this machine and do this disk and boot it on the old mainboard because it's a UEFI system. And then yeah, but, the, uh, the other direction, no, this system can't boot in BIOS mode. Now you have to finally migrate over your default configuration. Yeah, but it would uh, have look been at my so scenario, easy to have yeah, a yeah. window where you just install both boot blocks and then the problem wouldn't ever materialize as a real problem because by the time hardware appears which can't do you if I boot, almost all your systems would already be dual boot capable as in BIOS or UEFI. On that note, I think I, I have a fantasy tool that hmm? I'd like to propose that Please. somebody maybe has written, maybe there's something like this already, but there's a so when there's a there's, there's a Linux VM, because I use Linux for, for appliances like 3PPX and stuff like that, and they'll insist to boot with Grub, no problem. Um, and it's usually it's usually I mean, when I was first learning how to do it, I got to have to admit it was hellish to fix. It's not that big of a deal for me now, but but the but the Grub parameters are absolutely identifiable if you walk through the. If you walk through the disk, so why is there not a tool, or is there a tool, to examine the disk and create grub parameters for uh, for any given VM, so that we don't ever have to download a Linux VM and struggle with that anymore? I think that's doable. I think I could do it. Well, how about Linux people don't put like date stamps in the name of their init RD and stuff, so you can actually find some of that because i found that early on they were just all over the map and yeah that yeah <laughs> yeah so usually you're going to hit a grub you know a grub two or a grub config yeah. and we could at least have a little program that spits out options and probabilities sure so that totally any given any given civilian can can boot a boot any given linux uh grub or or UFI, UEFI obviously sure. um, on Beehive without yep. without trouble. That would be a nice thing to have, and I'm just wondering if if such a thing, if if anybody knows if such a thing does it does exist, and does the Lumos have this problem also? Andrew, uh, we lost him. He probably had to jump to a meeting. Um, ah, shucks. And this is specifically for Grub to Beehive, correct? Uh, I or have never had this also... problem with bias so... boot uh, hyper, uh, hypervisors. Yeah, well, fair enough. But but this is not for UEFI. This is for Grub to Beehive booting as some appliance from who knows who, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, got it. Uh, all true and noted. And I put it in bright red to let the world know 
Any other tool ideas from your years of production use? You know, one of my tools is almost done. Uh, yes, sir. For production use, which I haven't, I haven't published yet. It's it's a uh, uh, will. Uh, what's it called? Will SSH. Will SSH. No, will dot sh like a will, oh. like a human will. Will sh like like the like, like the thing that lawyers do when you die. Oh, will. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, started to hold that. Like, you mentioned uh, that. <laughs> Year, year ago when I was at Daniel's, yeah, yeah, and uh, the idea was, you know, in case I die, will someone have accesses? And uh, then I wrote it in a way that is portable, hundred percent. But I would love to have it in base, uh, actually. So j just to do like uh, screw you to every other operating system and say, oh, you have Open SSH from Open BSD and Will SSH from Free BSD. So yeah, that was the idea. Uh, yeah, it's basically a very long uh, file in TXT mode that you know when you give it some environment variables, it 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 will check via either RSS if you've blogged or tooted recently, and then it will check if you have uh, uh, logged in via the last log because we have a last log, and then if you haven't done that for the amount of time that you've decided, say a month, it will. Send an email via the mail function or uh, SFTP mail, um, and it will uh, let people know that uh, you know you've passed away, and these are the accesses to the servers. Um, oh, and, and taking can, a break and, and from the... also <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, and you can also give it an, an SSH key to someone else of someone right. else, and it will automatically add that into um, uh, authorized. The last functionality is probably a good idea to have people give you a public key or to have it sign someone's yeah. public key and hand out a certificate or something. But yeah. Yes. Sending out root passwords in plain text is um not a good yeah, idea. Right? Yeah, you are not be... around anymore if a if a trigger is correct, but what? still <laughs> I was I going agree, to agreed. say, yeah, taking a break from social media is not one and the same as dying, but for some it is. I grant it. Oh, great. <laughs> it Sorry has to be configurable. I'm a, I'm a millennial. so Oh, yeah, you're right. Kind of Sorry. Yeah, and, but yeah, it, and, it, and it is an RSS, you know, so, you know, Dan might not be active on Mastodon, but he's always blogs. So. <laughs> yep. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. And um, it can be multiple conditions. So something right? like that for office termination. It doesn't have to be... Uh, you know, part that's actually quite pragmatic, and I'm yeah, I hear you. If this user no longer exists, and add up. Hmm. <laughs> uh, useful for office turnover. Okay. Uh, while I have you all, uh, it, do we know if there might be a low hanging fruit approach to adding? say X509 certificates to Beehive's UEFI GOP VNC server to make it say compatible with uh, clients that support some form of encryption At or X509? simply that's what it asked for in uh, let me see I'm on a Windows machine here uh, on what is this tool? Can you just put real VNC tunnel in front of it? Well, so I'm open to ideas. I'm, can we, you know, have just like if a it's really SSL just a VNC over uh, TLS, putting S tunnel in front of it would work. Uh, well, and Jan, where you exactly had a, would that you... go? Sorry, go ahead, Daniel. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, no, Jan no. mentioned last time we were talking about something related to this. That you know that you could use fire firewall policy with an SSH tunnel, and then you Even know you better. could have yeah you could have people SSH into a jail, and then use firewall policy to defend the VNC. So therefore, you know that 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 SSH access is what needs to be defended. That's already already something that chips. You know we don't um, have to add another protocol over it. You could do something else. You could give them SSH access to the terminal in a TMAX session, and uh, on the second screen of the same TMAX session is a little terminal window for the out of band stuff, and the other TMAX window is the in band stuff. So basically, you normally you're on the console, and then you do basically 
B, Control B, Control uh, one, and tap over to the next one. And there you have the out of band one. And you could even have the out of band menu be the default and then just have it send a Tmux command to switch over the focus. If you do that. And if you log out, you can move the focus back to the main one and reconnect automatically. Um, so that also way you usable won't have for the, BNC maybe the functionality tunnel. people care about. Basically, tell me if it's running. Maybe if you have a way to do it, the external IP addresses and so on, um, then what is the system I'm looking at? Start, restart, shut down, reset, stuff like that. Um, right, we would need that, the deck, uh, Michael. That is a good point. We do need that that uh, access in addition to VNC because you know if if we secure the VN the VNC session, we still don't have a way for um, the operator the to is, re restart. You yeah. can uh, forward the VNC port via uh, SSH. For this, it would be really nice to have a VNet enabled jail for a beehive. Because then you would have a VNet jail with its own loopback, uh, which wouldn't even have to be connected if you use the. On FreeBSD, there is a, a PUM module called PUMJXEC or PUM jail, one of the two. What it basically does is it looks into the home path of the user for the knob sequence slash dot slash, splits this out, looks for the first part before the separator as the root directory of a jail. If it exists as part of setting up the pump session, a J um, attaches, so this means that then the established TCP connection, uh, so the socket, which is a capability, gets moved into the jail. So you can have a jail without network access for Beehive uh, and still SSH into it. By having the host SSHD uh, perform a jail attach as part of session setup for this user. It doesn't disturb normal logins, and yeah, it's a bit. Would this be um, the second or third advocacy for jailed beehive on this call? <laughs> yeah, um, the the nice thing is that now you have a secure sandbox in the form of a jail for this to run in, yep. so that you don't have to worry about. Oh no, this is a giant attack surface uh, for the because now you have a root process running outside of a jail. And then this, if you set it up correctly, it doesn't even have to be a root process because the operations could all be done through sudo uh, without passwords so that you can only in invoke the five commands you have to invoke or so. Yep. Uh, and connecting to the other side of the null modem pseudo device wouldn't even have to be privileged at all because you can just set up permissions correctly. Hmm. Have you done anything like this or simply explored it? Uh, I've set it up once as a test. Because uh, oh. I'll say yeah, use RDP I've... is not super helpful because you can't watch boots, Wait, steps, etc. No, no. Use RDP is useful. Oh, it's useful running... down the road, but for down not the, road, the entire once it process. Has, Windows guest has booted. Yep. It's faster than VNC. And no, no question. But it provides a richer interface and better. And the SAC is helpful, but diagnosing the very early boot is kind of important. <laughs> anyway. And the other part is that for this, you do the thing is users ask for VNC, but most of the time, what they really want is easy access to the console. And unless you're booting Windows, yep. you don't need a, text, a video console. Correct. Yep. For anything Unix-like, if you deployed it correctly, a serial console is all either BSD or Linux or Solaris so needs. Linux often has a bad habit of not enabling their 
console. No, so, that's not on Linux. That's the default configuration chip by distributions. It's a one right, but, or two line change to the Grub configuration to make it right. available during early boot. Yeah. Especially yeah. Debian is um, brain dead in that regard. Really? Okay. Yes, uh, they insist on having a not having the serial console enabled by default. Uh, you have to that's put a, a, that's one two of the lines, I think, I like in the Grub the... configuration. And they're already there as comments. Which is why right. I blame them for it being brain dead to not have it. I can't blame I blame them for everything. So well, it's remember a, early on, FreeBSD was the last OS to have like on if console to so you do get the serial access. It was kind of the frustrating one. What? For early well, Beehive and FreeBSD, it was like, oh, it you never have a serial no. console on by default. But go ahead. Well Flashback. on EF console means it's on if it's the console. Mm -hmm. Which what arrived Which in is 11, the same thing 12? to do. So yeah. to default, basically, have this on only if it's the system console yeah. as a lock -in. Yeah. So, and then you switch over which one is the system console and the get UI follows. Yeah. That's not, I would like to see on if exists as the default. Which means, yeah, if this device exists, spawn a Getty DUI on it, both on the text and the video, if it exists. That's a good point. And I don't remember which one is the default because that's one of the things I often mess with, so I can't look it up in my system right, to your system. verify what's the default cool. on an uncustomized system. Cool. Uh, Daniel, are you on the... Feed and have you ever seen this on a Windows Server SAC? The ignoring TDH while transmit enabled, which I'm guessing that's the virtualized Ethernet or something else. E twenty five forty five. Have you googled that string? I yeah, I haven't. I did uh, not find much, but I beyond me right again. What and is it, this? Uh, simply, I see that when booting up a Windows Server VM, I'm like, what is this? I don't know. So there's that. I'll do another search. And then even if anything, this is a clue of what is reporting that. So, ba 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 ba. And finally, Dan, you, you actually had some feedback on if you blow out your keyboard buffer by hitting the same system by VNC and RDP, you think it might come back to life. Oh, Antronik, just jump in, bro. Just... Come on, you! Come on, what you got? What you um, got? I just, I just was checking my notes. I see another error uh, in in Beehive that I've encountered in the yes, last twenty four hours oh, multiple fine, times. So uh, when the VM got stuck in the D mode, and you know, the we talked about the whole Beehive loader and everything with Grub and everything. Okay, so it got stuck. So my idea was, hey, I need to turn it off and start it again. Uh, so the correct way to do that is first you do beehive ctl dash dash destroy for the VM, and hopefully the process dies, or you send a sig term to the process to the beehive process itself. Uh, I say um, sig would come, the term would come first, no? Sig, sig term, sorry, yes. Sig well, term, yes. yeah, but send the sig term before you destroy. You can see if it yeah. cleanly destroys. Um, if if, if you be... say sig, if if you send sick term, it's not going to do anything because, you know, it's you're stuck. Stuck in the okay. mode, yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, what if I do beehive destroy uh, or, 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 as, or rather beehive dash dash force power off or force reset? So I what is D mode? Uh, did the uh, uninterruptible disk? I own okay. That's okay. So this is really the context you're talking about. Okay. Yes. In an uninterruptible so, mm -hmm. system. Got call. it. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Yes. So um, the first time I send Beehive CTL dash dash force power off or force reset, it just returns nothing. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe we all sh also should discuss about sending things back, you know, to like display. Like, we're not system D. We should show the user what yeah. happened, basically. Um, so that, that's one issue. Okay. It's not returning anything. I'm like, did it work? Did it not work? I have no idea. So I oh. do the same thing again. Is there I no return think, value on that? Uh, there, it's zero. It's zero. Oh, everything's zero. Yes. 
Oh, yeah. That yeah. just means yeah. the command didn't Excellent. fail. It doesn't mean the okay. command has successfully finished. Yes. So then I do force power off or force reset again, and I get a single line. It says Erno equals 37. Uh, so now I'm digging inside the IOCTAL codes to understand what the hell 37 means. Yeah. And specifically, it says Erno equals 37. I I don't know what 37 is. If anyone knows, developers, please let me know. But um, otherwise, I do. I he just already, pasted it. Oh, where did you find this? It's, In the uh, Erno man page. Wait, which man page? Beehive's man page? There you go. Erno man page. It points you into the intro to oh, man page. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm dumb. I totally forgot about this man page. Okay. He already already in progress. Okay. Yeah. So I, I keep getting that. Okay. So there you go. That's what it means. Um, And yes, to answer the question, if I do, I, I can't do anything else. I can't destroy it. I can't kill the process. I can't do anything. So my only solution is to restart. So like whenever my uh, VM can't restart. Boot, the host, you mean? Hold on. Be specific. The host. Restart. Yeah, the host. Yes. Yes. So, my, so the whenever my VM, whenever my guest doesn't boot, I have to restart the host, which is like kills the whole idea of a hypervisor. <laughs> you think, yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> you had one um, job. You had one but job. But what you exactly. can still do is look up uh, with Dtrace, for example, the uh, basically get a stack dump and find out where it's blocked. I have I have a stack dump for all the uh, threats, but unfortunately I I forgot about that and I got the stack dump after and it got stuck. Yep, you want both the user and the kernel state. Uh, kernel yes. stack. I stack only trace. have the kernel state. I only have the kernel stack trace. So, oh, Jan, that's a good question. Can I ask Dtrace to print the case stack of a process without hitting any? Uh, yes, probe? but I don't know how you can do it. You don't have to. You can inspect it somehow. I just don't remember the way, syntax. For Understandable. It okay. You can okay. run basically one shot thing. Do it during the startup, and you have to make sure to target the right thread process, whatever. But D trace basically, um, it's easier. And the next thing you can then do is basically find a situation shortly before, and then attach a debugger or something but yeah yeah th that i can do i'm i'm pretty fluent in that these days but or I just you could, have... could attach a kernel debugger to get the stack trace uh which may yeah. even get you a richer interface because then you can interactively walk the data structures and so on yes. but you can of course completely shred the running system like that yes but i have to say that um so one of the ideas that I had is to do um, s stop using dtrace, like uh, figure out what's the what? step, what's, what's the previous to last a step that Beehive is being stuck on, right? Um, Finding that and then yeah. doing Wait. dtrace stop. So it will stop you the can process. Ask, one of the things you can definitely do, which would be interesting, is to uh, have uh, dtrace capture the stack trace uh, on a, a periodic timer. Oh, that's a good point. Yes, that's also a very good point. Yes. Um, so with, because with it could be uh, that while it feels like it's stuck in the operation, uh, which is in uninterruptible, so it should be fast, may take hours or days for some reason, and you're not prepared to wait that long but it could yes. be that the it's not completely frozen on one side or the other yes so oh, which reminds me uh, does because uh, go if you look at it in top you sample at one hertz so it mm -hmm. could be that it ignores most signals uh, then basically does something for uh, uh, half a millisecond and then continues blocking again and actually, it's just a badly written process which masks uh, all signals which are maskable or something. <laughs> Not that I hope that's the case, but yeah, if you just sample the 
stack, especially the kernel stack, where it's quite likely that in the kernel, it's not completely blocked and something there may make progress or oscillate between two equally useless states or something. So, yeah. Another one that I have. Hold a on, before you go on, is... is that what you said, Jan? Capture the trace on with a periodic timeout. Timer. Yes. Timer. Yes, timeout. Called... Timer. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. Okay, Timer. cool. Timer. Uh... It's called. It's called. Uh, there are two ways to do that. There Tick is or something. Pro... Yeah, there is HC? the profile mode. No, there is the profile mode, which is it could it could be in nanosecond, microsecond, millisecond. Uh, and... The profile uh, th that's one option, and the other one is called the uh, tick timer, which is tick dash, let's say S1, S2, S3, etc. So you can use there, and they do different things, you know, uh, depending on what you're doing. In this case, the tick is the one that you want. Um, so yeah, that's that, that's another way to do that. Um, okay, basically. cool. Uh, I do have to ask, however, it has and uh, do we have any protstat gurus here? Because in protstat. There is or proc stat if if you're Pro, probably uh, proc. Yeah, uh, I mean it's a process, you know. It I, be yeah, process. I know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, I'll grant you that. Yeah, ZFS, sure. Okay, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the proc stat has a k stack subcommand or dash k, which I think it should print the it should print the kernel stack is that the same as running dtrace k stack is anyone aware of that that also would be something very interesting yeah so that, that is something that i don't know much so about and i would love to know the k dash k k stack does what and you'd like to see what so your proc stat has dash k or yep. k stack is the same thing yep. uh, it prints the kernel stack Okay. It says it prints the kernel stack, but will I get the same output if I use the dtrace k stack function, right? So I, I don't know, do they do the same thing? They, they sound ah. the same, they look the same, they look exactly the same actually. Uh, but yeah, that's the that's the question is, is will, 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 will they print the same thing? I haven't tried this before. I have to go into it and try because it one might be a very useful development tool to let people know that, oh, sure. okay, you don't, yeah, so that, that's that's another good question. And yes, I do have the K stack of a process of Beehive that's stuck in D mode. Or IO inter uninterruptible IO, you know. How so, big is it? Uh, it's not that big. It's not as big as you would think. And uh, which does in. remind me, yes, uh, which does remind me that um, uh, one thing I did notice that when it's stuck in uninterruptible IO, the threads haven't started yet, just in case someone knows the flow of Beehive. The threads are not started yet because when it continues, then it starts one thread per CPU. So it the threads were not started yet. So it was somewhere, you know, after opening the file descriptors for tap and MNDM and all of those and before starting the threads, whatever was getting stuck was in between these two. Hey, that's a good information for myself. So only on boot or in general? Only oh, this was boot. with the grub beehive. Okay, yeah, never mind. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, Samuel. And we'll still discuss your. Uh, uh, hex zero stuff, hopefully. And uh, yeah, I'm curious sense, about that yeah. too, because that's one of those long term eyes on the prize topics. Thanks for joining. I hope you enjoyed it. Good night. Take care. Cheers. Um, anything else? We've covered some really good ground. Uh, none of the topics. I was thinking developers might jump on, but we didn't have any developers, which is just fine. And we but, can push this uh, the next one. Yes. Antonik, um, so it looks like it would be possible to implement the external reboot request by just converting any non-crash uh, shutdown into a reboot request as exit code. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So map shut down to what? You know, the, I just looked around a bit in the code yeah. and it shouldn't be that hard to add. The, the not Don't even tell the guests that uh, this shutdown request is really an external reboot request. Just send it a shutdown request via HCPI and then uh, 
report to the uh, through the exit stated that it was a reboot request from the guest. Basically, a white lie. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, okay. That's from a host talking to the guest or the guest. So right now, there. if you want to uh, perform a clean shutdown of a beehive guest, yep. you send it a sick term. If the guest has already uh, activated ACPI, so Beehive knows yep. that it's an ACPI operating system and not stuck in a bootloader or running a very yep. old operating system, <clears throat> yep. this will then get turned into an ACPI uh, shutdown request. Okay. The sick term. Which the basically the equivalent of pushing the power button on a normal desktop PC for a second, but less than three. So just the normal, please shut yourself down. And so if you do that, and but you really want to do a restart, a clean restart. So what you do, and you don't have a rich enough interface to have the the guest operating system per request a restart on its own. So if you have an SSH login into the guest, you can already type sudo reboot and reboot. But the problem for an external supervisor like uh, SuperV is that if it uses something like SV term beehive dash guest name, um, then the exit code returned by the Beehive supervisor process looks like it's uh, a shutdown, not because that's what actually got delivered to the guest. So the guest will, as its last step, tell the hypervisor, yeah, uh, I'm shutting down. And now the that's the case which uh, so far Antrinic solved or worked around with... Um, a state file which records that the next uh, shutdown is really a reboot. You would put that into Super V, right? The work in progress branch. Yes. And, it's cool. and the idea if you put it into Beehive, this basically if you track this state that the next clean shutdown is really a reboot, just change the exit status with and then the uh, in the case of Super V, the finish script will get the exit code for a reboot and treat it as a reboot and will now disable the service so that the supervisor will, the process supervisor, either run it or S6 or something else, will then just reboot or restart the, the process. Its startup code will run, it will do the normal startup y things. And everything is fine. <laughs> yeah, when like we say startup uh, things. We understand, like you know, enterprise starts startup enterprises. Not, not, you know, not, 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 startup not the process. Like, uh, I mean, things like destroy, uh, destroy any stale devices which are around uh, stuff like this. Make sure you, its tab interface exists and is on the right mm -hmm. bridge, or that its virtual function uh, is for on the NIC is there stuff the setup stuff. Okay. Yeah. Looks like we've covered good ground. Should we call it a day? I Are think so. For... Yeah. We are at nearly two hours. Two hours. Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah. So, Anything else? Last call? <laughs> Last call. Ding, 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 ding. ding, ding I don't ding. know, uh, Andrine, uh, you want uh, for the yesterday so uh, i don't know if you've i've shown you the crap i'm writing for uh, a tooling friendly if config yeah yes. he, jan uh, gave me a quick demo so let's call the official call and yeah and then i can, I can walk you can through it and uh, because i could use your input on that okay that well, was a cue nothing. to say goodbye to all the nice listeners bye bye like and subscribe like and subscribe